sprinting is a key component for many team sports. Various strategies are used to enhance sprint performance, with sled training being one of them, which consists of pulling a sled with an external resistance provided by the sled mass and the friction between the sled and surface. There are several things to consider when programming sled training, including surface, attachment point, cord length, sprinting distance and phase, training objectives, as well as the sled load. Regarding the prescription of sled training load, there are four methods that can be used. Firstly, using absolute load is simple to prescribe. For example, performing 3 times 20 meters using a 15 kilogram sled load. However, it doesn't account for the variability in athlete's performance, i.e. velocity and force production, and characteristics, i.e. body mass, body composition, and anthropometrics. Therefore, a 15 kilogram sled load used by two athletes may result in different adaptations, as well as reduced sprint velocity in a distinct manner. While using relative loads does take into consideration the athlete's body mass, for example, completing 3 times 20 meters using a sled load of 15% of body mass, it still does not take into consideration the variability in the athlete's velocity and force production or their body composition and anthropometrics. Therefore, like absolute loads, the same relative load used by two athletes of similar body mass may lead to different adaptations and result in different reductions in sprint velocity. Whereas, velocity decrement is a more individualised approach as it considers the velocity loss of the athlete as a result of the applied load. For example, performing 3 times 20 meters using a sled load that results in a 15% velocity decrement. Prescribing loads in this manner involves a thorough velocity loss assessment through an incremental loading sprint test. For example, from 0% body mass to 80% body mass. This requires access to timing gates or radar guns that can be costly, or the use of mobile apps and video analysis technology, which can make the velocity loss assessment rather time consuming. And last but not least, performing the maximum resisted sled load test protocol requires loads to be incrementally increased starting from 15% of body mass until the maximum resisted sled load is achieved, which is the final sled load before an athlete can no longer accelerate between the 10 to 15 and 15 to 20 meter interval of a 20 meter linear sprint. Therefore, the maximum resisted sled load test provides a reference point to prescribe load, rather like a percentage of 1RM. For example, 3 times 20 meters at 40% of the maximum resisted sled load test value. Prescribing sled loads in this manner, like velocity decrement, accounts for individual variation in force, velocity, as well as body composition and anthropometrics. However, the test protocol is laborious to implement and like velocity decrement, requires expensive equipment such as timing gates or mobile apps and video analysis technology, which can be time-consuming to use. To help with the understanding and prescription of sled training, the article, published in the Strength and Conditioning Journal, titled The Use of Sled Training to Improve Sprint Performance in Team Sport Athletes, by Santiago and colleagues, based on task specificity, firstly outline common training methods, including primary, secondary and tertiary methods used to improve sprint performance, as well as put forward guidelines specifically for the prescription of implementing different sled loading schemes. This presentation, brought to you by Talking Sports Science, will be a summary of Santiago and colleagues' research. Firstly, primary methods don't include sleds, as primary methods simulate the traditional sprint pattern based on the execution of unresisted sprint efforts. For example, implementing short and long sprints, static start sprints, flying sprints, maximum sprints, as well as stride length and frequency exercises. Moving on to secondary methods, these simulate the sprinting action and can be divided into assisted and resisted sprint training methods. Means of implementing assisted sprint training to allow athletes to achieve a fast speed artificially without provoking large disruptions in the sprinting technique include the use of elastic bands, motorised resistance, and downhill running. While means of implementing resisted sprint training to provide an external overload without resulting in large disruptions to sprinting technique, include the use of weighted vests, elastic bands, motorised resistance, parachutes, uphill running, and of course sleds.
Therefore, the term sled training refers to the device used independent of velocity decrement, whereas the term resisted sprint training is the training method. When sled training is used with the intention to replicate sprint running movements using an overload, it's recommended to use lower sled loads. The use of low to moderate sled loads to enhance sprint performance can be considered a secondary method, with low sled loads being classified as between 0-20% of body mass or between 2.5 and 10% velocity decrement, while moderate loads are considered between 20 to 50% of body mass or between 10 to 30% of velocity decrement. Regarding low load sled prescription, a sprint distance between 20 to 30 meters and a session volume of around 160 meters or more with a weekly volume of around 450 meters is recommended. And for the recovery, this should be one minute for every 10 meters of unresisted sprinting with an additional 30 seconds for low sled loads. For moderate sled loads, a sprint distance between 10 to 30 meters and a session volume of less than 160 meters with a weekly volume of between 3 to 400 meters is recommended. Regarding recovery times, again, this should be one minute for every 10 meters, but with an additional 60 seconds when using moderate sled loads. A low sled load session example includes performing 5 times 20 meters at 20% body mass or 10% velocity decrement, as well as performing 2 times 30 meters at 10% body mass or 5% velocity decrement. Whereas, a session example using a moderate sled load includes performing 4 times 20 meters at 30% body mass or 15% velocity decrement, as well as 4 times 10 meters at 40% body mass or 20% velocity decrement. And moving on to tertiary methods, which do not reflect the traditional sprint movement pattern, although they do provide specific new muscular stimulus and evoke key adaptations for sprint performance. Means of implementing tertiary training methods to improve sprint performance include resistance training and plyometrics. Heavy and very heavy sled loads can also be considered tertiary methods. This is because they disrupt sprint technique and require a very different movement pattern to execute compared to unresisted sprints. Heavy loads are considered between 50 to 80% of body mass or between 30 to 50% of velocity decrement, and very heavy loads are considered above 80% of body mass or greater than 50% of velocity decrement. Regarding heavy sled load prescription, a sprint distance of between 10 to 20 meters and a session volume of less than 120 meters with a weekly volume of around 2 to 300 meters is recommended. Regarding recovery times, again, this should be one minute for every 10 meters of unresisted sprinting with an added 90 seconds for heavy loads. A session example using heavy sled loads includes completing 4 times 15 meters at 50% body mass or 25% velocity decrement and 2 times 10 meters at 60% body mass or 30% velocity decrement. Regarding prescription for very heavy sled loads, a sprint distance of less than 10 meters and a session volume of less than 80 meters with a weekly volume of less than 200 meters is recommended. And for recovery, again, this should be one minute for every 10 meters of unresisted sprinting, but with an additional 120 seconds for heavy loads. A session example for very heavy loads includes completing 8 times 5 meters at 80% of body mass or 50% of velocity decrement. Regarding sled loading schemes, because positive adaptations in acceleration or maximal velocity phases may be load specific, it's important to recognize that with the progressive increase in sled loads, the stress placed on lower limb muscles is gradually altered with respect to unresisted sprint performance. For example, hamstring activation is attenuated with heavy and very heavy sled loads, indicating that these strategies are not adequate to increase the specific performance of these muscles for maximum sprint efforts. Whereas quadriceps activity is increased with heavier sled loads, this along with a more forward leaning position as a result of heavier sled loads indicate that these stimuli may be more related to the muscle activation pattern observed during the initial acceleration phase of sprinting. It seems that light to moderate sled loads may induce superior and more generalized gains in the entire distance velocity spectrum and may be more appropriate than heavy or very heavy sled loads to improve top speed qualities, beneficial for both sprinting and team sports. That being said, 
it still remains unclear what the most appropriate loading condition for enhancing sprint performance through the use of sled training is. Nevertheless, because heavy and very heavy sled loads induce different mechanical, technical and physiological alterations to sprinting technique, they should be used with caution. However, when they are used to improve the maximal force production at slow velocities, beneficial for those sports where maximum acceleration is important, i.e. the first steps of a sprint, as identified earlier, low volume of short or very short sprints is recommended. And that concludes the summary of Santiago and colleagues' research for using sled training to improve sprint performance in team sport athletes. Thanks for listening, folks. See you next time.